السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته. الحمد لله رب العالمين والصلاة والسلام على سيد الأنبياء والمرسلين وعلى آله وصحبه من استنى بسنته إلى يوم الدين. اللهم اجعلنا منهم ومن الذين آمنوا وعملوا الصالحات وتواصوا بالحق وتواصوا بالصبر أمين رب العالمين ثم أما بعد فأعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم. بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم. قل يا عبادي الذين أسرفوا على أنفسهم لا تقنطوا من رحمة الله إن الله يغفر الذنوب جميعا إنه هو الغفور الرحيم رب شحد صدري ويسر لي أمري وحن العقدة من لساني يفقه قولي اللهم ثبتنا عند الموت بلا إله إلا الله اللهم اجعلنا من الذين آمنوا وعملوا صالحات وتواصوا بالحق وتواصوا بالصبر أمين رب العالمين Inshallah, I will only be talking to you about one ayah. I will not talk to you about anything else. Just this one ayah that I feel I can share with you. Those of you that are going to try and remember this, Inshallah, this is surah number 39 and ayah number 53. So 39, 53 is the reference to this ayah, this discussion that we're about to have, Inshallah. In this ayah, there are two conversations. And both of these conversations are really, really important to understand. One lesson, and by the way, in both conversations, Allah is talking to two different audiences. One conversation is between Allah and someone who is trying to preach Allah's message. The other conversation is between Allah and someone who has lived a life of sin. And they, they do so much sin that they've completely lost hope. And they feel as though they are so messed up that at this point they are never going to be able to become a good person again. So they, they feel like they've reached a point of no return. Once again, there are two conversations. One conversation is between Allah and the one who is trying to send a message to people, a da'i. Someone who's trying to preach, someone who's trying to give good advice or counsel. And the other is Allah talking to someone who is sinful. Of course, the when we try to give the message of Islam to people, who are we emulating after? Whose model are we trying to duplicate? It's the model of the Messenger of Allah When we call people to Allah, we're trying to copy what he did because he's the first and the best to call people to Allah. The ayah begins with the word qul, say. And it's singular, meaning Allah is saying to one person, say. That one person is the Messenger of Allah Allah is telling His Messenger what to say when He talks to people. What to say when He talks to people. So remember I told you there are two conversations? There are two lessons? The first lesson is Allah is teaching His Messenger what to say. And when we learn that carefully, what Allah is teaching His Messenger to say, if you and I ever want to do the work of da'wah, and if you and I ever want to talk to someone engrossed in sin, then we should take this ayah carefully because now we're also learning what should we say to people like that? The second conversation, Allah tells the Messenger to tell these people that are in, immersed in sin, tell them that I'm still willing to talk to them directly. What should you say to them? Ya ibadi alladheena asrafu ala anfusihim. My slaves, those of you that have made violations against their own selves, those of you that have gone beyond limits, only harming your own selves. I'm using a simplified translation to get the message of the ayah the words, the, the first words are, my slaves. My slaves. Who's talking? Who says my slaves? Does the messenger say my slaves? Or does Allah say my slaves? Allah says my slaves. So the messenger is supposed to go to people and tell them, look what Allah says to who? Says to you. You know when somebody's really upset with you, they don't talk to you? Right? They refuse to talk to you. So you could say, you know, Allah is not angry at you. Or Allah might forgive you, but you're talking about Allah. But in this ayah, Allah is not, not only talking to you, He's giving you hope. He's talking to you. So that you're, remind, you're, you're reminding the sinful person, listen, Allah is directly addressing you. Now, when the one who does a lot of sins, you know in Arabic, one of the words for that is Muslim. Muslim. Muslim is someone, Allah set a limit, and He went beyond that limit. You know, literally, when you set a border, like you put a, a fence, and you tell the horse, don't go past that fence, you train the horse. But when it crosses that fence, that fence, the horse is called a Muslim, right? 
Allah sets a limit. Don't eat this. Don't look at that. Don't do this. Don't do that. Remain within these limits. When you cross those limits, then the, what is this person called? Muslim, right? The ayah doesn't say, tell the messenger to speak to the people and say, قُلْ يَا أَيُّهَا الْمُسْلِفُونَ People who go past the limits, listen up. Don't lose hope in Allah's mercy. It's not like that. Allah says to them, Ya ibadi, my slaves. My slaves. You know, in normal discourse, who you call a slave of Allah? Like that person, such a good slave of Allah. The word slave implies someone who obeys the master, someone who loves the master, someone who listens to everything the master says, doesn't it? But what I'm trying to get across to you is this ayah is not talking about people that obey Allah, it's talking about people who what? Who disobey Allah. But Allah says, even talks to them and says, my slaves. Ya ibadi. This is a term of love, and also what they're being told is, no matter how much you messed up, you still haven't lost your ability to become a slave. You still have a hope. You still, there's still hope alive with you. So much so, not only am I talking to you, I'm calling you by a good name. Ya ibadi. By the way, the word abd is also used in the Quran for the Messenger. Alhamdulillah, الذي أنزل على عبده الكتاب. سبحان الذي أسرى بعبده ليلا. Subhanallah. That word, slave, is used for Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And in this ayah, Allah is using that word to call the person who sins. The person who is immersed in sins. What does he say to him? Ya ibadi alladina asrafu ala anfusihim. My slaves who have crossed the limits only harming their own selves. Who have transgressed against their own selves. You know when you break the rules, when you break the rules, you figure you've harmed the one who set those rules. Like if your parents told you don't do this, that, or the other, and you do it, you figure you've hurt whose feelings? Your parents. You've harmed your parents. So when you cross the limits, and when you break the rules and regulations, and you disobey, you are hurting someone else. But according to Allah, in this case, whenever you sin, whenever you cross Allah's limits, who are you hurting? You're only hurting yourself. So Allah tells you, my slave who is so bent upon not hurting me, but hurting himself. You can't harm Allah, you can't take away from him anything. So when you and I disobey Allah, who are we harming? Our own selves. You've only harmed yourselves. And by the way, I want to tell you what this harming yourself, some practical examples of what does it mean that you're harming yourself. Since there's a lot of young people here, I know some, some really young people here too, but I should still share this with you. When you see something shameless, when you see something shameless, you've actually harmed yourself. Every time you see something shameless, your heart becomes harder. You lose a part of your humanity. Animals have no shame. But Allah gave human beings a sense of shame. And the more you see something shameless, the closer you start becoming to what? Animals. The closer you start becoming to animals. Until a point comes where there's no difference between you and an animal. You know what, the, what makes an animal an animal? An animal has no control over its urges. It's hungry, it bites. It sees a, a mate, it runs after it. The squirrel running after the other squirrel around the tree. <coughs> Crazy. Right? It has no control over its urges. No control over its tongue. No control over what it eats. No control over where it goes. Whenever it feels something, it does it. Right? Which is the contemporary equivalent of saying, I do whatever I feel like doing. You ever heard that expression? I do what I feel like. I'm going to do what I want. You know what that, that by definition, what behavior that is? <laughs> the behavior of an animal. When you become accustomed to shamelessness, you are closer to becoming an animal. When you don't care what you eat, it doesn't matter, halal, halal, you don't care. Whatever goes in your it's okay. Then you are no different from an animal. So who are you harming? You're harming yourself. Allah gave you the status of human being and you want to reduce yourself to an animal. SubhanAllah. You're only harming yourself. And by the way, those of you that are a little bit older, Especially when it, when it comes to shame, there, there are two problems, I believe personally, there are two problems that Muslim youth have. If they can solve these two problems, they have no other problems, as far as I'm concerned. They got no other problems. The first problem they have is they are not respectful enough to their parents. The second problem they have is they are overexposed to shamelessness. Two problems. If you can solve these two problems, you got no other, everything else will be solved. Everything else will be fine. You don't make salah on time, it'll be fixed, don't worry about it. It'll, it'll come into play. You don't know it, you don't have enough knowledge, knowledge will come to it. 
you know, those everything else will fall into place. But these are the two things that are eating away at the life, the, the life of Muslim youth, and reducing them from not just believers, but even from human beings to animals. Even Muslim kids are being reduced to like the likeness of animals. The number one thing was what? What was the biggest problem? Yeah, not enough respect for your parents. Not enough respect for your parents. So you know when Allah is talking about the slaves who went against beyond their limits? You know what the number one limit you're crossing is? And as far as you guys are concerned? What you owe your parents. How much respect, how much dignity, how much regard, how much obedience, how much love you owe your parents. That's the first thing. By the way, when somebody does you a favor, what's the least you should do? Thank you. You're walking to school, a friend of yours pulls over, says, I'll give you a ride, man. And he gives you a ride, the rest, and it's snowing, and it's, you know, it's freezing, and he gives you a ride. When he gives you a ride, when you get off the ride, what do you say at the very least? And what kind of indecent, despicable person would you be that they did that for you, and then you don't even thank them? Right? That would be a disgusting human being. You don't even have that much dignity to say thanks, man. Now, just think about, you know, a, a, a lot of you have this conversation among yourselves or even at school 